All right, there you go. Sorry about that. Little technical difficulties there, but we're on and welcome. Welcome to our monthly live for November. Um, like I said, we, we're slightly off month, but we, we are still doing a November live here. So um, Gian here, Calvin, and we'll have Dr. Isabel behind cameras, and she will be coming in just a few um to present on our topics our topics for today calvin are um the the do not well the disease topic for today is canine distemper um you can't say it's a zoonotic disease because well it does up to date it has not affected any human being but it is a one health um concern topic right um, yes it is and then we have the uh, HKT laws and regulation. Um, we know HKT month was in October, but I mean, it's still important to go through. And then we will go over an invasive species that we have not only here in Belize, but in, on uh, most other continents uh, around the world. Um, before we get into the topics that we have for today, so we have some announcements. So we have started the Wildlife Ambassador Program has started its um, in-person sessions, at least with the police officers. We have been to uh, Belize, Arindra, and Benke so far. We have a couple more sessions in the schedule for us. And then this coming month, we want to start the in-person sessions with our community ambassadors um, and for that we will be sending out emails with dates or tentative dates hopefully um, later today or tomorrow we're doing actually we're doing dangriga next week so if you're a community ambassador from dangriga or placencia or anywhere in this district let us know shoot us a message or an email um, it will be possible for you all to join those face-to-face -face sessions. Yes. Um, so let us know. We sent an email to you all yesterday. Um, so you can either sign up or just message us um, to register you for that in person next week, which is Tuesday and Wednesday. Yes. Just remember, you have to be a registered ambassador to um, be a part of that session. And if you are not registered, you can still register and you are able to take the full two days workshop um, there at Dangriga. So mm -hmm. if you're still interested, you can actually sign up now and be ready for next week. So, yes. And remember, registering for the uh, program gets you a chance to enter into a raffle for a two night stay for two at Ian Anderson's Caves Branch. That's right. All right, so so we'll start now, and I'll give Dr. Isabel space. Right, so it's so we have Hikatilas, turtle invaders, right here, slider, and we will start now with canine distemper, and we'll have Dr. Isabel, and we'll just go over a few questions, and if you have some questions, dear, um, in the comments, ask, and then we'll see. We can probably discuss some questions on canine distemper virus all right so yes dr isabel so we're looking at um canine distemper you want to give us a small overview on what it is yes so first of all hello and thank you so much i will still provide a more in-depth complete presentation at some point in the not too distant future but for today, just a little single sitting verbal summary. Uh, and as Calvin already uh, pointed out, this is actually our first disease that we are addressing. That's not a zoonosis that affects humans, but it very much affects uh, our domestic animals as well as wildlife. And we humans uh, play a big role in the control and prevention for it. Um, so it is a viral disease caused by the, um, well, there are actually um, seven known lineages of this virus. It's a morbillivirus, 
And what we see most of um, here is the canine distemper virus is one of them. Uh, there is also the human measles virus that's uh, in the same morbillivirus um, group. So we have uh, other species that are affected by the same um, very similar uh, viruses. So okay. that is what it is. All right. Very well. Um, my first question up here is how can dogs get distemper? How would they get it? So dogs will get distemper through direct contact with other dogs. Uh, distemper, the virus can spread through the air, which is always mm -hmm. more dangerous, um, as well as through vectors as well. In this case, inanimate vectors, so to speak, which is humans again. Us having the virus on our clothes or shoes, carrying it over to uh, um, our home pets, for example. All right. So we run risk if we handle a pet with this temper and we take it home and handle our own, we run risk yes. of transmitting yes. it down. A very high risk. All right. Very well. All right. And with that, can humans get this temper? No. So we humans, while we have our own, so to speak, morbili virus, there are no known cases of canine distemper virus in humans. Yeah, right. So that's the good news and uh, the for reason, us yeah. humans. All right. So hence the reason we, we're seeing it's not a zoonotic disease per no. se, right? But again, of huge one health um, influence, right? It's something that we want to consider. All right. Are puppies more prone to get this distemper than adult dogs? Yes. Um, the immune system is always more, well, is still in the process of being formed at that age, so they are more prone and they are more frequently unvaccinated. So, uh, sorry to jump into prevention here because treatment really is not uh, um, possible. What is crucial for this disease is the prevention through vaccination. Mm -hmm. And because puppies uh, need generally speaking, two or three vaccinations. Um, if they are in conditions where they are exposed, so especially stray animals, of course, uh, have a higher risk there. Mm -hmm. uh, then we do see more puppies with this. But it can also just as well affect adult animals. So it is uh, mm -hmm. not exclusive to puppies. Okay, all right. Mm -hmm. Um, and turning into the wildlife perspective, can wildlife get this temper? Well, if so, which animals would be the more uh, prone to get it and which one to look out for? Oh, so there is a whole range of species, uh, wildlife species that have been affected by the canine distemper virus. And where, so from mustelid species, which here would be our grissom and tyra and river otters okay. to uh, feline species and especially large felines um, it's a big concern um, and then of course our um, canine uh, species as well so speaking of foxes and or um, just today we're having a mm. report of an animal uh, which is a raccoon that is showing um, signs that would very possibly be caused by distemper. Could be. Hence the reason why I would always recommend not to handle wildlife, right? And with that, we have a question here says, can wild animals give pets distemper or can we be that sort of transmission there? Yes, yeah, so it goes more the other way around, actually. Mm -hmm. Because we have high concentrations of pets, unfortunately, we have a lot of pets that are not vaccinated. And then our stray populations, which allow for this virus to spread. And then we have the unfortunate wildlife that is getting into these semi-urban areas and getting in contact with infected pets. And then wildlife gets it. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to distemper in most wildlife species, uh, the canine distemper is adapted to dogs and dogs 
have a uh, mortality rate as well. So not all dogs survive distemper. Mm -hmm. Um, but in wildlife, these mortality rates are much, much higher. So mm -hmm. most wildlife infected with mm -hmm. distemper acquires it from domestic animals okay. and uh, suffers more from the disease. Right. But it is possible that there would be some sort of transmission in that case. Yes. All right. What would be signs of distemper if? there's any yes so that is uh, again a very diverse uh, answer there we have many different signs the cardinal signs that we see are often neurologic so the animals are ataxic they're wobbly they're trembling they're falling over they're walking weirdly uh, and then they may also walk in circles and um, or show a lot of behaviors that we would also see in a rabbit animal, which is why, again, this disease, even though it is not a zoonosis, it is a really important disease for awareness um, as a so-called differential. Right. Um, so that's neurologic signs. I just got started. We have respiratory <laughs> signs. Uh, we have ophthalmic signs, and then we have other chronic signs. So respiratory means they can just have a cold. In a nutshell, any fever with multiple systems affected in a dog has to have this disease as a differential because we may see changes in, again, their lungs, their eyes, their nose, their pads, their skin. Mm -hmm. um, and the way they act and behave and their nervous system. Uh, and I may have forgotten something too, because as said early on, I haven't yet done my full uh, research for this really broad, uh, complex disease. All right. So wide, wide, wide array of signs, but those are the main ones, right? Neurological, respiratory, um, and you say alphatic? Often uh, eyes, often eyes. Um, um, so All right. have to switch up yeah <laughs> <laughs> all right can a dog recover from this temper once yes they can it depends on the viral load that they get mm -hmm. if they get a very high load of uh, virus and or their immune system is very compromised they will die and mm -hmm. there is as so as often with neurologic diseases there is no easy way to predict it mm -hmm. unless you know how much virus did this animal uh, ingest and okay. you won't know um, so hard to tell but it may be possible that they may survive it and would they have some sort of neurological yes. effects thereafter yes okay. uh, um, so it's quite common to see chronic sequels, chronic consequences of this infection, mm -hmm. where they remain a little bit wobbly mm -hmm. their entire lives, mm -hmm. for example. Um, okay. And skin changes are also seen in um, chronic survivors. survivors. Um, okay. Okay. Is there any treatments that can be given, or would it be symptom-based? It is um, supportive care. That is all you can do in, as in most viral infections, we don't really have, or we have very, very few to in veterinary medicine, almost no uh, antivirals that we can use or should responsibly use due to the concerns that we really need them for um, humans. Therefore, all that we can do is supporting them with um, fluids and uh, care. All right. Uh, yeah, and more, but we're not here to discuss treatments too much other than specific treatment for the disease does not exist, uh, making prevention so important. Okay. So, all right, well, let's, let's look at the last question there because we do have one here on the comments. Um, prevention, and how can you avoid this temper? So yeah, key thing, vaccination. Vaccination, vaccination okay. of dogs according to manufacturer's instructions. 
which generally speaking, this is the five and one vaccine that is instructed to be given uh, at week six, nine and 12, uh, including parvo then one more time actually. And with that, you can be reasonably assured that your animal will not contract the disease, uh, nor will it necessarily spread it. Um, and next prevention is of course to be aware of this to be to eliminate the contact so don't let the dogs roam because that's where they may get in contact with unvaccinated stray animals uh, that have the virus and then may also spread it to wildlife okay well, with that note how are we in terms of distemper in the lease i heard that last year we had an outbreak have... Yes, so we have, uh, I, uh, again, I don't have the precise numbers mm -hmm. on this. This is something that we have to really look in uh, conjunction with all the veterinarians. Mm -hmm. But there have definitely been uh, reports of uh, outbreaks uh, sporadically from Belize City as well as in northern Belize and uh, for the other areas. I will have to ask the other colleagues. Oh, right. um, I have personally sent in three cases, uh, in, but it was uh, two years ago now. Mm -hmm. I think last year we haven't sent in um, okay. a suspect case, but we've also not really seen domestic animals here for general consults mm -hmm. uh, and only wildlife. Okay, so definitely something to look out for in those areas and in general, right? Yes. Gregorio Daniel has a question here saying, what are the differences between distemper and rabies? What system of the animal do they affect? And how can you tell or suspect this disease is at an early stage? Um, so the difference is that's a really good and important question. Uh, the difference, the, the differentiation can really only be made by looking at how the disease develops or virus testing, which is uh, done by PCR for uh, distemper. Um, and as far as I am aware, not available in Belize, so requires sending samples abroad. Um, and for rabies, the testing can be done here in Belize, but it requires euthanasia of the animal first so that it can be tested. So it is of crucial importance to treat any animal that is suspicious of distemper as suspicious of rabies and to avoid at all cost any direct interaction and touching of these animals where any scratches could occur or contact of the saliva of this animal with any minor wounds um, and or wounds inside your mouth as well. Uh, um, so the differentiation is not possible by clinical signs. Um, if no human is uh, at risk with this animal, if no human has had the contact that would have put him at risk, then uh, an animal can be quarantined to observe. And rabies is 100% fatal. So, and once the animals show clinical signs, they will generally be uh, dead within no more than seven days. Um, whereas distemper may then develop more other symptoms, uh, including the signs on the eyes and the, resp uh, the respiratory system, etc., and becomes more of a chronic disease. Whereas rabies, once it reaches showing signs, and the problem is in the beginning, they can look exactly identical, and there is no way. Uh, to tell them apart. So it requires utmost um, precautions, hands off, uh, protective gear, uh, um, and reporting any scratches or bites. Mm -hmm. Sorry, that's the lengthy one, but uh, that's why this disease, even though it's in, in quotation marks just an animal disease, it is so important uh, to be aware of. So you're sharp, very hard to tell, right? So, talking about distemper here, I guess the last part, how can you tell or suspect this disease is at an early stage? It's, it's tough, right? It's tough, so it's progressive. 
um, the animals become more and more compromised. With rabies, again, this process is reasonably fast, where then they will no longer be able to stand, they will be uh, down, um, they are no longer aware of their surroundings, and they may become either aggressive or very uh, subdued. And for distemper, they will progressively become more uncoordinated. And as mentioned earlier, depending on how strong or how high of a load they got infected with, they may actually slowly recover or start recovering at some point. Or they may progress um, into, again, being down, out, and um, passing. All right. OK. Well, thank you for your question, Rigolo Daniel. I hope that more or less covered what you ask. Um, I don't know if, well, no one else has asked any questions, but very interesting, right? Very interesting. And um, yeah, maybe we can do more of these diseases in the future and probably do it this way. And you all can ask your questions and what you want to learn about this specific diseases, right? So. I think we have two more topics, so we will close this temper for now. But do ask your questions. If you yes. still have questions, we can um, look at them throughout the live. But for now, thank you, Dr. Isabel. Um, and we will close this temper for now. Thank you. All right. So we have Hiketila left as well as invasive turtle species right so which one should we go for first calvin well before that we can go into the first uh, mm. quiz question we have prizes, we have prizes. <laughs> all right so question one how can we prevent our pet dogs from being infected with canine distemper uh, the options, A, vaccinate and keep up to date with vaccinations. Allow them to play with unvaccinated dogs at the parks or on the street or um, training class. Um, C, when out on walks, allow them to have contact with wild animals. D, administer a series of vaccines to puppies. So we leave up the first quiz question up for a bit so we can Look at the uh, options, take a screenshot. <clears throat> Multiple answers, right? There is more than one answer, so select all of them and send us. Um, I'll comment the answer yes. in the comment section. Just the letter will be enough. All right, so now we can move on into our second topic for today, which is the laws and regulation with concerns to the Hikati or the Central American River Turtle. If they give it separate, does it count? <laughs> All right. So the contents of this presentation is an introduction to what the species is, uh, the laws and regulations of the Hikiti, and how you can help and where you can learn more uh, about the species and more about how to uh, help. So the Central American River Turtle with the scientific name Dermatemis maui, or as we know it, the Hikate, is the rarest turtle in the world and is listed as critically endangered in the IUCN Red List. And the IUCN Red List is a scientific database um, that tells us the extinction risk of each species that has been um, studied so far. So this Hikati turtle can be found in Mexico, Belize, Guatemala, and Honduras. And it is a fully aquatic species and their mating season 
is from September to November and they can lay their eggs which can stay in place for up to 200 days until the temperature is good for them to hatch and sometimes it may take up to 300 days for the eggs to hatch after they have been laid so some um, uses that well uses the rikete has come into play uh, it has been a food source for hundreds of years even the ancient maya uh, ate it and with the growing human population and increased consumption rate then that has increased pressure on the survival of this species itself along with some other um, threats like habitat destruction habitat loss So the male and the female can be differentiated with the males having a bright yellow head and their tail is generally longer and broader than that of the female. Um, but keep in mind the yellow head only comes on the turtle after it is sexually mature. So laws and regulations in concern with the Hikati. As Belizeans or as citizens of Belize or people passing through Belize, we cannot sell or purchase a Hikati turtle. This is illegal. Um, they have a closed season to hunt the species from May 1st to May 31st. Yes, just one month. I know, right? And one person cannot be um, caught with more than three individual turtles at one time. And for vehicles, only five turtles are allowed in a vehicle at any point in time. Even if there are two people in the vehicle, still only five turtles are to be in that vehicle. There are size restrictions when it comes to the females. <clears throat> they should be between the sizes of 15.2 inches and 17.2 inches. And this is the length of the carpus, the top part of the shell. So that must be from the point where the head is to where the tail comes out. It should be between 15.2 inches and 17.2 inches. Um, to capture these animals, the use of nets are is prohibited so if you want to catch the animal um, you'd have to do it by hand um, there are some places in belize that it is illegal to capture these these turtle species um, that is outside of protected areas but that also includes in protected areas no hunting can occur in any protected areas and they cannot be kept as pets. So you can't catch one or two uh, hikatis and try to have them mate, lay eggs and raise the eggs. No, um, it is best to leave that to be free, which is a license uh, organization, organization um, with permission to breed these uh, turtle species. Um, this image here we got uh, we got it from channel 5 news and it is from one of the seizures that occurred back in 2019 so how can you help save the hikati turtle well avoid eating the hikati meat obviously if we leave the hikatis alone then they will have a chance to bounce back from their critically endangered status and eventually hopefully make it to least concern so following the fisheries laws and regulation um, which i just went over and even conserving and protecting 
the habitats that these uh, that this turtle species occupy, which is mostly uh, rivers, ponds, um, some in brackish water, right? And yes, yeah, so leave the he get <laughs> leave the hikati uh, breeding to the experts, right? That should be captured. <laughs> So, in order to learn more about the Hikati and what you can do with regulations, you could visit the Belize Fisheries Department uh, website, fisheries.gov.bz, or give them a call if you have any questions. Or you can visit the Be Free uh, website as well at befreebz.org, or the Lamanai Field Research Station at lamanai.org, or TIDE as well at tidebelize.org or Turtle Survival Alliance at turtlesurvival.org And that's it for the Central American River Turtle or Hikiti Alright So, do we have um, answer for question one? I don't know, there's a um carolina with two separate answers i mean that would be fine i think so so yes carolina the answer for the uh, first question is to vaccinate their dogs and keep them up to date with their vaccinations and where puppies the a series of vaccines, I think, as Dr. Isabel mentioned, the five in one vaccine mm -hmm. series uh, does contain the um, distemper. distemper as well. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. So I guess we could go to the second question. And this one is based on Hikati regulation in Belize. So this one has more than one answer. Select the correct Hikati regulation in Belize. A, only six turtles per person is allowed. B, no more than five turtles is allowed per vehicle. Uh, female carpus size or length limit is between 15.2 inches and 17.2 inches. Um, D, the turtles can be captured using nets. And E, there is an open season of from June 1st to April 30th. We leave this up for a few seconds. And again, select all that applies, right? Multiple correct answers. All right. So, hmm? oh yeah, we have a sound for the Hikati. Alright, so, so just as a fun interlude there before our next topic, I uh, want you to enjoy this short little music video on Hikati, Mr. Hikati, by, well, the guys from the... It's Damien. It's Damien. Hello, Mr. Hikati. How things set? Not a good. I nearly get chasing a one head. Stop play real talk that make me upset. Yes, sir, you would not believe what happened next. Talk to me, how the people had your head. The next couldn't work, so he died instead. What are going with the people, humans again? I know, right? I really think we'd have my friends. Which turtle believes to the bone? Hikati, Hikati, Hikati. Which turtle you can't care who won? Hikati, Hikati, Hikati. Which turtle eat greens, no fish? Hikati, Hikati, Hikati. Which turtle?
to grow 25 inches. Hick at it, hick at it, hick at it. The hick at it turtle critically endangered. Let's see if the turtles, our neighbors, been around long time, not strangers. My Belizean people be the saviors. Where can I find the hick at it? Guatemala, Mexico, and Belize. Beautiful creatures. OMG, please. See if the hick at it is my sweet Belize. Which turtle believes to the bone? Hick at it, hick at it, hick at it. Which turtle you can't care who on? Hick at it, hick at it, hick at it. Which turtle eat greens, no fish? Hick at it, hick at it, hick at it. Which turtle grow 25 inches? Hick at it, hick at it, hick at it. Hick at it turtles, hardly on land. Active at night, them get to action. Up in the river is the mansion. It serve as the home to the hick at it gang. Hick at the turtles, love the fresh water. Hick at the turtles, love the motherland. No bad man battles in the fresh water. Somebody talk to Dr. Sutherland. Hello, Mr. Hick at it. How you been lately? Not so bad, but things still kinda crazy. What can I do so the turtles no hate me? Well, love and protect my baby. Not a problem, me G. I agree with that. Yes, I me talk to all me ladies, got me back. Tell me one thing that could make you smile. If me ladies may be a national reptile. So that's a fun song there from Be Free and Turtle Survival Alliance, right? Um, you can find it on YouTube. Just look for it, Mr. Hikati um, Sing Along. It's right there on YouTube for you to enjoy as well. All right, so no one answered um, that last question. I don't know if you want to put one quick look at it for question number two. And send us your answer. Do you think it is correct according to the regulations? You get the regulations. You get the regulations in Belize. Mr. Steven says we had a huge outbreak in Placencia last year. That's again in distemper. And it may be due to the raccoons spreading it to dogs. Possible? Or the dogs spreading it to dogs. All right, so we can go into this last topic, which is turtle invaders. All right, um, fun little topic. I mean, name deer should have this guy's the, the little turtle deer as a little alien invader. Um, next time we'll do it. But yes, talking about um, turtle invasive species, we have. Um, the red ear slider. Maybe you have heard of it. Maybe you have not. Um, but yes, uh, these guys are usually pets, um, and well, they cause a lot of problems. Right? I do think you all know and are familiar with what is an invasive species. You all know about um, the what's the fish called? Lionfish. The lionfish. Right? They are species that are not native to the country and then they come in and cause a lot of trouble to our native population so the red ear slider is one of them um so we'll be talking about how to differentiate the red ear slider from two or four other native turtles here in belize um, i'll give you a little overview on the red ear slider itself how they enter belize um, and how they get in in the environment um, why and what is an environmental threat in regards to these guys and what should you do if you would find a red ear slider in the wild yeah mm -hmm. so here are some differences from my left to my right i have the red ear slider in that first uh, column there then i have a similar turtle which is the forward turtle and then we have the mesoamerican slider um, to my farthest right so um, the red ear slider and the mesoamerican sliders they do look alike um, and people could confuse them 
the main difference there well a little bit on your carapies or their shells the top and bottom shells however the obvious difference would be that red little stripe uh, behind the eyes of the red ear slider as you can see in the um, picture there to your left right the mesoamerican sliders will not have that coloration there right so that would be the main difference when it comes to the red ear slider the mesoamerican slider right they do look very much alike however it does have that little red stripe behind their ears um, and then why we have the firewood turtle here is because they actually have a small little red stripe around their eyes somewhere there in your head they have some sort of um, red little coloration there however if you notice in the middle pictures where it has a plastron the bottom shell there's a much blacker um, coloration to their bottom shell right so that's the difference between the forward turtle and the um, red ear slider there are some coloration when it comes to the top of their shell as well even though you can't see it much it's more it has some decorated um, coloration on the top of your shell but huge difference here um, sometimes hard to tell and whenever you're unsure just send, a, send us a picture and we can um, help you with the identification of these um, turtles right so when it comes to red ear slider trachemis crypta elegans it's a subspecies of trachemis crypta which is the regular um, sliders uh, these are native to southeast central um, US and all the way up to northern Mexico. These are found in usually freshwater or brackish environments and can live in uh, evergreen forests whereby you have a, um, a water source nearby. They can also live in moist lows and muddy areas as well. They can grow anywhere between 10 to 29 centimeters. Um, and they're sexually dimorphic, meaning that the males and the females, you can tell apart physically. Um, for these guys, the females are usually larger. Right, so that's how you can tell them apart, as well as uh, less obvious would be their tails. They usually have an oval shaped carapace, their, their top shell. Uh, with sharp edges and flat smooth plastron which is their bottom shell they have large yellow lines present on greenish yellowish um, to gray um, or even a brown black carapace right so it, it, there's a, a bit of variation there but those yellow lines are always present um, and their plastron their bottom shell is usually more yellow with black markings their skin will be from a very dark brown green, sorry, from a very dark green color to a brownish um, color. So that's how their skin will look like uh, along with these yellow stripes as well and that obvious horizontal lines behind their eyes with that bright red streak, right? That gives them the, the red ear name, right? Even though it's not exactly their ears, uh, but that's more or less their ear region there so how do these guys enter belize well the main issue with these guys is pet trees people get them as pets and they enter to belize um what it, it may be legal pet trade possibly illegal pet trade as well um you may need an import permit from the ministry of agriculture if you do bring these in and they are subject to inspection upon arrival by quarantine inspectors these are sold mainly in pet shops around the country and you see them sometimes at markets um, and people buy them as little little turtles and they try to grow them and um, well these guys can grow big they can grow right up to a foot in length uh, and weigh up to three kilograms and eat a lot and kind of hard to manage once they're full-grown adults so people sometimes would have trouble feeding them or have trouble uh, dealing with them and eventually they would get kind of tired of them and release them into the environment 
um, and that is bad we, we don't encourage that and we try to advise people against that because well they are an invasive species and they will cause trouble for natives right some of them can enter the environment as escapees right they can escape their uh, their pets enclosures or their pet habitats that you have them at home and enter the environment that way right so that is how they could enter into the environment and compete with um, our native species when it comes to the threats of these guys at a human perspective well we always have to watch out for zoonosis in this case we know that one of these zoonosis that can pass to humans would be salmonellosis uh, there's a lot of link between salmonellosis and reptiles especially these guys so it's always good to watch out for these things always wash your hands and take proper um, sanitary procedures when it comes to handling these guys and the biggest threat there is that there are a invasive species species and not just here in Belize across many continents and across uh, a variety of other native turtle species they cause a lot of problems they do cause inbreeding which means that they will um, try to hybridize and, and breed with well the wrong turtles the related spi uh, slider species they do create hybrids and uh, well that is not necessarily good in an ecological perspective they compete they are very strong competitors with the turtle um, species that we have here natively they're more aggressive they eat a lot more um and you know they do as a whole just compete stronger with the native turtles and they introduce new diseases into the environment since they come with a history of um pet trade and what's not they can bring more diseases into our native populations which are not um used to those diseases right they might be more susceptible Right. And, well, long-term ecological impacts are still being studied, but a lot of these things are obvious and you can tell already that they cause problems with the environment. So, what can we do um, if you have a red ear slider or if you find one in the wild? Well, never, ever, ever release a red ear slider uh, pet. If you get tired of your pet, give us a call. Give us a call and we will try to figure out what we can do with them uh, there's a variety of options but it's it's best just to give us a call if you have one and let us help you decide what we can do with that right or bring them at the clinic where we will be glad to take them in and take whatever steps um we would find best to do with them if you find one in the wild if you're um somewhere by a river or something and you find a red ear slider well call us firstly don't take actions in your own don't, yeah don't take actions in your own hand since misidentification could be a issue there we don't want you to um, intervene with a forward turtle or a mesoamerican sliders those can be left alone but um, first call us send us pictures to make sure it's a red ear slider um, and since hybridization is possible um, it's best for us to help you or other turtle experts to help you in providing a red ear slider and again call us and we will let you know what can be done with that turtle all right so turtle invaders red ear slider if you have one see one um don't release them in the wild don't let them get in the wild let us know we can help you all right, so uh, Stephen Wamser uh, posted a comment saying that there was a huge outbreak of this temper virus in Placentia, and he was told it was due to the large population of raccoons that were spreading it to their uh, doves in that island, uh, well, on the peninsula, peninsula. side. <laughs> and Dr. Isabel sent a note in response to that. She said she will research that incident more closely, but she was under the impression that the spread is more frequent from our uh, pet dogs to wildlife. 
but she can't be around, so she will do that. Uh, uh, mm-hmm. Take a further look into that. So the quizzes, I believe we have an answer here by Kiria Chan. Fair question number two. And the answer is B, C, and E. Uh, no more than five turtles. A vehicle is not, well, uh, people are not allowed to have more than five uh, turtles per vehicle. And the size limit for the female ticket is 15.2 inches and 17.2 inches. And they have the open season from 1st of June to the 30th of April since the close season is the month of May. Mm. So going into our third uh, and last quiz question. What should be done if a pet radiator slider is too big for me to house? Which is one of the reasons why um, releases happen into the wild so a release it into the wild b call bwrc for advice or assistance c uh, kill it and d uh, let it loose in my yard this one is an easy one let's who who will get that one congrats kirian congrats carolina yes you can um you can pass for your little calendar prizes here at the clinic while we do that we can play a um, public service announcement based on the red ear slide This turtle is called a red-eared slider. They are not native to Belize. You can identify if he extends his head you'll be able to see the red on his ears. For comparison, we have a red-eared slider alongside a furrowed wood turtle. Red-eared sliders came to Belize mainly through the pet trade. If you go to a pet store and you try to buy a pet turtle, most likely you will get to buy a red-eared slider. These turtles are here at the clinic because they were once someone's pet and they didn't want them anymore so they decided to relinquish them to us. They did not release these turtles into the wild because red-eared sliders are an invasive species to Belize. So they are they pose a threat to our native Central American slider because these guys will actually go out into the wild and eat the eggs of our native sliders. So they put the our native populations in danger. So here at the clinic, we actually have a visiting reptile veterinarian, Dr. Adolf, and he performed a spay on one of our red-eared sliders. She was sterilized. This means that she won't be able to have baby turtles. Here we are one week later. These red-eared sliders have been sterilized. Essentially, what we're trying to say here is if you're thinking of buying a red ear slider as a pet, remember that these guys live for about 50 to 70 years. So you want to make sure that you can give them a home for that amount of time. If you already have red eared sliders and you wouldn't like to keep them anymore, please contact the clinic, bring them in, we'd love to take them in. 
these guys will be staying with us until we can find them a better home. For more help identifying the red-eared slider, you can look us up on Facebook or on our website where we have a catalog showing the differences. If you happen to find the red-eared slider in the wild, you can always pick it up and bring it into the clinic. Right again, you can find this video on our YouTube channel. I think we have it somewhere in our Facebook as well. Um, but yes, that's what we're doing here on YouTube. Search for it. Um, for quiz number three, Carolina won this one. Um, and yes, the correct answer is B. You would want to call us for advice or assistance when it comes to um, trouble red ear slider. Right, so don't release it in a while. Call us, give us a call. We are here to help. Yes, available 24-7. Remember our hotline. Um, not only dealing with invasive species, but uh, native wildlife species as well. Mm -hmm. All right, so Carolina and Kiria, you can pass at the clinic to pick up your prizes. Um, again, anytime between 8 to 5, Monday to Friday. Yeah. All right, so remember if you are from Stantic Strand Creek District um, and you want to join us next week, please register if you haven't or just let us know and we will sign you up for uh, those workshops. They're free lunch snacks. Um, and yeah, you just need to let us know by tomorrow so that we can arrange our numbers and have you and post you at Dandriga next week. And for the wider community we are going district by district hopefully by the end of the year so we are planning one day face-to-face -face workshops around um, the country so look out for those and hopefully you can make it to those so uh, that's it for today Carolina says the last time I won do you still have my winning deer the prize like yes more than likely we <laughs> have it somewhere here saved up and just let us know when you're coming for it and we have it here for you no problem so here for orange rock then probably when we go to orange rock you can take it just let us know um yeah so with that we're glad to have WAP on its well on its way and again the 28th of january uh reaching out to all our wildlife ambassadors you are invited at the san ignacio hotel where we will do a little year in resume we're having um, some really nice um, lectures and topics we'll talk about that day we'll give a couple of awards and prizes um lunch of course so don't miss out the january 28th national um wildlife ambassador program conference right so each okay. ambassador is entitled to come and that's where we're ruffling that um two nights for two at ian anderson's cave branch yes so make sure to register and complete the program before that date. Yeah. All right. See you later this month with December's Facebook Live. All right. So we will see you then. Take care and see you next month.